Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. I wanted to be a filmmaker from age 12. Gathering the personal stories, hearing their memories of that time. It's just something I need to do, and I will be doing it for the rest of my life. Today on Spotlight, did you know St. Louis was one of the nation's largest shoe manufacturing cities? We take a look back at this time. Plus, an award-winning broadcaster pens a book about America's haunted racial past. And then meet an artist who sculpts jewelry inspired by flowers and other pieces of nature. But first, one of the most acclaimed filmmakers, how he got his name on every Mac computer. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. I wanted to be a filmmaker from age 12. I watched my dad cry at an old movie and I had never seen him cry before and I realized how powerful therefore film could be. And so I wanted to be a filmmaker, but that man a feature filmmaker. But I ended up going to Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. And all of my teachers were documentary filmmakers. And so I kind of quickly uh, rearranged and ended up being a documentary filmmaker. I'm interested in telling stories. I'm, I'm first and foremost, I mean, a lot of people call me a historian and I guess I am an amateur historian, but I'm really a storyteller, a filmmaker. And fortunately, history is mostly made up of the word story plus hi, which is a good way to begin a story. And so I'm just drawn to stories in American history and all of the films we've made to date have been in American history. And sometimes the idea will take several decades to incubate. Sometimes you'll want to do it right away, but other things are happening and, and it gets put off. Other things you just drop everything and start doing. I've been trying to will old photographs to come alive, to treat them as if they were not two-dimensional static objects, but living, breathing, dimensional things that had a past and had a future from that moment. And so I've employed a lot of techniques, not only visually, but also orally to do that. And my friend Steve Jobs, uh, he became my friend, uh, had decided to try to experiment with panning and zooming on uh, photographs. And so it's a very superficial way, but it's been an amazing tool in iPhoto and iMovie. And it's been since January of 2003 on every single Mac computer and permits people to transform birthday parties and vacations and bar mitzvahs into a story using kind of rudimentary aspects of the technique. But I'm trying to treat each photograph the way that feature filmmaker that I originally wanted to be would have done with a master shot, a long shot, a medium shot, a close shot, a tilt, a pan a reveal and isolated details of the frame and then add to it. And I don't just look at the photograph, I listen to it. You know, are the cannon firing? Are the troops tramping? Is the horse winning? Is the bat cracking? So all of these things are an attempt to, to will an old photograph alive. There are four oral and four visual tricks or things that we employ. Obviously on the visual side, we have still photographs, we have newsreel when we have it, we have live cinematography and we have interviews. The sound side, the oral side has a third person narrator, which is not uncommon, but we also have employed for decades, a chorus of first person voices that read letters and journals and diaries to which we add to the third person narrator and supplement with authentic music from the period and then also a very complicated sound effects track sometimes hundreds of tracks that we're mixing down to make that old photograph or that painting come alive we have a funny saying in the editing room which is that this two-dimensional stuff the paintings and the drawings and the photographs we treat as live and we treat the live as if they're paintings so we might go to an now quiet battle site at Gettysburg and try to take a frame that looks gorgeous and try to exclude all the modern things that are there and then take a shot that's painterly and at the same time we're trying to find the paintings and make them come alive with all of those effects and techniques that we've been talking about. 
The story of the buffalo seems at once sort of specific and singular, and yet it touches every aspect of our very complicated past, particularly our past that deals with Native people's manifest destiny and Western expansion. And so the story of the buffalo is a kind of tragedy and then a parable of de-extinction and a complicated ongoing story. Too often we've seen ourselves as the dominant species on Earth, but unrelated or unconnected and unobligated to everything else around us. And the important thing to understand is that quite often our point of view, our perspective is not necessarily the only one. It never is the only one. Sometimes you have to just stop and listen to other people. So this film is populated with Native Americans, with indigenous people, with scholars and biologists, and they can remind you that there's a whole new way of seeing things. I'd rather be reaching people that don't necessarily know the story of the buffalo or aren't necessarily caught up in conservation efforts because maybe however significant or however marginal that change might be, you have the possibility to speak to as many people as possible. That's, that's what I want to do and that's what a good story does. So this is so much more than the story of the American buffalo and it is of course specifically about the American buffalo. I've been working with my cinematographer, who was my assistant in the early 70s. So it's been 50 years working with Buddy Squires. It's been more than 40 years working with Jeffrey C. Ward, Dayton Duncan. It's been 30, Lynn. It's been more than 30. And I've tended to use people again and again. I do like that continuity and I do like the intimacy of that working group. But for as many as uh, people that we rightfully thank in our credits, hundreds, um, these are all handmade films. So even something as big as the Vietnam series, 10 episodes, 18 hours, it's really made by 15, 16, 17 people, most of all handmade in that way. And so we don't have legions of researchers. It's just a handful of us looking and trying to find the information or the, or the visual material. At the same time, we're constantly bringing up new folks. And so we're constantly refreshed. And many of the people that we've now been working for a long time started off as interns, worked their way up the ranks. But I'm really thrilled that people stick around. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hi, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell from the Missouri Historical Society, and this is History Spotlight. During the early 20th century, St. Louis was one of the nation's largest shoe manufacturing cities, but few shoes were labeled made in St. Louis. Curator Adam McFarland explains why and how you can tell which ones were. Have you ever gone to a vintage shop and bought a pair of shoes? Did you know that those shoes may have been produced in St. Louis? St. Louis has had a shoemaking industry since the 19th century. It began in the mid 1800s, mostly as wholesale. So that means they were bringing in shoes made from somewhere else and shipping them off to different locations using the Mississippi River and other river systems, or also using the train system. During the last part of the 19th century, some of those companies started moving from wholesale into manufacturing. In 1899, St. Louis was producing about 8 million pairs of shoes, and by 1909, just 10 years later, they tripled that to over 24 million pairs of shoes coming out of this city. That included 50 factories with over 50,000 employees. While St. Louis was producing a lot of these shoes, rarely did those shoes ever have St. Louis stamped on the shoe anywhere. So it didn't say made in St. Louis. It might have said made in USA. So how do you know they were made in St. Louis? What I have to do is look through online databases like newspapers.com or through trademark databases and look for brand names. So a lot of times on these shoes, you might see something like Buster Brown, but you have to know that Buster Brown was a shoe made by the Brown Shoe Company of St. Louis. So in the Missouri Historical Society collection, we have been working on looking at our own shoes in our own collection. And we have found that we have about 280 pairs of St. Louis made shoes. And we are still adding to that collection today. St. Louis was 
one of the largest producers of shoes, particularly in the early 20th century. They did claim to be the largest producer in the world, at least as of 1910. In the 1970s, shoe manufacturing really started moving overseas like a lot of other industries because it was cheaper to produce the shoes in foreign countries. And unfortunately, a lot of manufacturing here in the United States across industries just started to dwindle. The loss of the shoe industry really affected the St. Louis work economy. And one of the things that was unique about the St. Louis shoe industry is that it was all parts of the industry. So it wasn't just designing the shoe or taking all of the parts and putting them together. It was actually the leather manufacturing. It was producing the shoe lasts. And the lasts are basically wooden or steel molds that the shoes are formed around. So when those industries started moving overseas, that was a lot of workers that were no longer needed here in St. Louis. Having a St. Louis shoe in your closet is a really great way to feel connected to St. Louis history, but also to American manufacturing. Next week on History Spotlight, why the St. Louis Motor Grow open to a near riot. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries. Individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. In Driving the Green Book, award-winning broadcaster Alvin Hall takes us on a journey through America's haunted racial past with the legendary Green Book as our guide. The Green Book, whose official name is the Negro Motorist Green Book, was created in 1936 by Victor Hugo Green and his wife Alma, who at the time lived in Harlem. Victor was a postman in New Jersey, Hackensack to be specific. During the summer, he and his wife would take trips to go to Richmond, Virginia to visit Alma's relatives. And on their way there, they would encounter aggravations. They could not use bathrooms. They could not buy food. They could not stop at a place to sleep. Victor became frustrated about this and decided to create a publication to help people find the services they wanted when they were traveling. At first, he went among his friends, gathered information, and so the first Green Book really focused on primarily New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, and a little of New England. The next one expanded upon that, and then by 1938, people started to hear about the Green Book, and it gradually started to spread across America. It was published every April or May at the beginning of the ho summer holiday season so that people could use it when they were on the road. This was such an integral part of black life, especially traveling, and yet so many people don't even know that it ever existed, including a lot of black Americans. How did you find it? I found out about the Green Book when I was on an airplane. <laughs> Not even in a car. When I fl fly around, I typically like to buy magazines. So I buy a stack and I'll go through them and read them and leave them on the plane. And in this case, I saw a little sidebar that mentioned the Negro Motorist Green Book. This was in about 2015. I thought, what is this? I've never heard of this publication. So I said to myself, when I get back to New York, I would go to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and I would see what it was about. So the Green Book is named for its founder, Victor Green. Victor worked as a postman in Hackensack, New Jersey. At the time, there were two postmen's union, one for white postmen and one for black postmen. Victor was able to tap into people that he knew in both of those unions, and they would tell him about places in cities where they delivered mail that would be appropriate for his travel guide. It must have been so cool to just peel away the layers as you took this journey? It's not just peeling back the story of the Green Book. It's when I'm out talking to people about it, gathering the personal stories, hearing their memories of that time. Families who recall using the Green Book, 
One of my favorite stories was told to me by Hezekiah Jackson in Birmingham, Alabama. He would say he would be at home and his mother would be all at church and somebody would come and knock on the door and said, uh, can we borrow that green book? Uh, and he said, well, when mama comes back home, and they kept it in a part of the house, and people would come over where they were taking trips to visit relatives in New York or Detroit, and they would want that green book because, as he said about his family, when we travel, my granddaddy had the green book and he had his pocket Bible. It was that important. It was that important. To find out how the famous Rockefellers are involved in marketing this book, watch the full interview at hcmedia.org or scan the QR code on screen at the end of this show. Art exploring serious issues later on Spotlight. Mark your calendars for the 2023 St. Louis Art Fair, taking place September 8th through the 10th. Get to know the artists and their art before heading out to the fair with HEC Media's Meet the Artist series at youtube.com slash meet the artists. My name is Leah Zumbro, and I make small sculptural wearable jewelry. I actually started with a class when I was 16 at um, Craft Alliance in the Del Mar Loop, and I just fell in love with physically making things. You know, just using your hands to make things. I don't think that's something that we always do. So I, I feel like when I took that class, I was just like, this is amazing. I can make things out of metal and I can wear them afterwards. And there was just something about like being able to manipulate metal that really just caught on. My work is botanical and celestial inspired. So I'm looking at seed pods, I'm using plants as my inspiration, walks in the woods, you know, seeing the night sky, and just the beauty of our everyday world. It's just this really magical but ordinary thing. It just becomes ordinary. So I'm always thinking about like, how can I make some of these things into wearable sculptures, kind of like little talismans and reminders of that beautiful natural world that we can take with us. So I start out with a drawing. I do like a lot of really loose sketching. So I just get the idea of a shape, get the idea of a gesture, and then I, I move into metal pretty quickly. Uh, once I have an idea in my head, kind of hammered out, and then I will physically start making things in metal. I hope to inspire people to um, remind them of the magic of the natural world, the, the world around us, and get excited about handmade art. You just never know where that spark is going to come from. You're putting a human touch to everything through the vehicle of art. We give them the ability to hope. This is our 25th anniversary here at the Butterfly House, and we thought what better way to celebrate our silver anniversary than celebrate the silver screen with lights, camera, arthropods. We're celebrating the intersection of insects and arthropods and bugs and movies. And so as guests come in, the first thing they'll see after their admissions is our insect zoo featuring animals from around the world. So here at the Butterfly House, we are always trying to get the public excited about the small world that lives all around them. In addition to seeing the butterflies, we have so many other amazing animals we like to share with our guests. We have things like cockroaches and tarantulas that may not always be appreciated and we want to share our love for these animals with our guests. So before you even get to see the butterflies, you'll pass some of our amazing animals. We're going to have signage explaining why they are so important to our ecosystem and hopefully you'll leave with a little bit of understanding and appreciation for how important these animals are to the world that we also share with them. So we have some fan favorites on display here in our insect zoo, such as our leaf cutter ants and our giant flamboyant flower beetles. These are insects that could have won their own Insect Academy Award for things like set design, costumes, or even best actor. For instance, our tarantulas have won awards for best hair and makeup because many of them are very colorful or very fuzzy. For the set design award, you might check out our hermit crabs. 
They are famous for moving their own houses around with them and building their environment to suit their needs. Not every animal here at the Butterfly House may have won a Bug Academy Award, but we love them all the same and we celebrate them all as if they're winners. Hopefully you too can come and check out our amazing insect collection here on display at the Butterfly House. In addition to the animals here in Small Wonders, we have over a thousand butterflies always free flying in our tropical conservatory. We've added some new touches to our movie where you can see samples of how insects and Hollywood have come together over the years. Explore our native garden where you can see some fun plants and animal duo interactions. And there's a lot more little things to find and discover this summer. Lights Camera Arthropod is happening daily this summer through Labor Day. If you want to learn more or reserve your tickets online, visit us at butterflyhouse.org. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. It started during the COVID pandemic, early April, May of 2020 when we were just trying to understand what does this mean to all of us as human beings. I was sitting in my home and feeling very scared and vulnerable and I do a gratitude exercise. I try to tell myself, okay, calm down. You have a roof over your head. You have family around you and you have food. So you're, you know, it's good. Just think about all the good things that you have. So I went through that exercise and the very next day I read an article about how the pandemic would affect victims of domestic and sexual violence. And it completely took away my essence of what I was trying to say to myself, to calm myself, right? This home, this safe space is a place of violence for people. And so that's where the journey really started. As an immigrant myself, I put myself in the shoes of people who have left their family behind, their education, everybody that they know, and they've come to this new place to start a life with no bank account, no credit card, no driver's license. How, how does that translate in, in an abusive situation? How vulnerable it makes people, you know? So the immigrant and refugee population is a vulnerable group within an already vulnerable group of domestic violence survivors. So I was trying to figure out what are these stories and how can we bring awareness? People are not aware of domestic violence being such a prevalent and disturbing factor in so many lives. People don't recognize that. It's not talked about. It's not shown outward. It's just hidden within these communities. In the beginning, it was not even about creating the work. It was about doing the research. So I reached out to not-for-profit organizations, people who help with translation and legal services and mental health providers, and just to understand, like, what are the resources available and what's going on in this community? I also got a lot of data, like, how many individuals ask for help for domestic violence? How many of them are men? How many of them are women? Uh, how many of them are in the LGBTQ community? So just collecting this information and kind of making sense to it was almost a year long process. And that information dictates what materials I use to show the work. The, the artwork is a story that's told by me, but these are stories of people who have lived through some very traumatic experiences. I work with different social service organizations, and they were the ones who connected me to survivors who wanted to open up. Not everybody wants to relive these stories, but some of them were comfortable doing it, and so they were the people that I spoke to. Every person's story is unique, and I respect their privacy, which is why I take a abstracted version of the story to present to the viewer. I was constantly surprised at the resilience that people showed, the amount of trust that you have to rebuild in yourself to create a life for yourself, and in some cases, women with very young children. 
living far away from everybody that they know. So it's a constant source of inspiration for me personally to talk to these incredibly strong women. The idea is uh, threefold actually. One is to build awareness. These are some of the cultural issues that we're having. These are some of the legal issues we're having, mental health issues we're having within these communities. The second is how do we make it actionable? How can they volunteer? How can they donate? And the third part of it is policy change. So nothing will really change unless we change the policy. And the best way to change the policy is to educate. One of the things that I want to bring awareness to is the idea that a lot of these social service programs was not designed for people who have come as immigrants and refugees. So there is another barrier, there's a language barrier and a legal barrier that is in place that makes it harder for people like that to come out and even understand that these resources are available and even understand that certain practices that they think is okay in their household is actually illegal. So to make the general public understand that there is that divide, you know, that we need to bridge, um, that is a big part of why I put together this project. I use a very intricately hand-cut Tyvek paper, watercolor paper. That's where the journey started with, with my installation work. But I also work with plexiglass, steel mesh, aluminum mesh. I am working more and more with different kinds of technologies as well. A big portion of the work, though, is still hand-cut paper. Paper is very uh, delicate, but also very strong. When you cut the paper out and when you reshape it, it just occupies a space in a very delicate, almost ethereal way. Within the scope of domestic violence, paper is also power. So the right kind of paper, especially for someone like me who's an immigrant, will grant you admittance into a country will give you protection from the law. It is really important when I bring an artwork into a different space, where is the light coming from? And where does a shadow fall? It also ties into a domestic violence survivor's untold stories. There is one part of a human being story that we see, and then there's so much going behind the scenes. Whether I have a place to show it or not, uh, whether I sell my work or not, it's just something I need to do and I will be doing it for the rest of my life. Next week, find out why there are video games in an art gallery. Plus, Mercy Doctors are the first in-state to use pacemakers in a new, more natural way. And to watch the full interview of The Green Book from earlier in the show, scan this QR code. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.